Hello and welcome to another edition of GNET TV's In-Depth Series. I'm Andrew McKeever, the news director here at GNET TV's News Project, and it's a pleasure to have you with us today on Monday, December 9th. It's also a pleasure to be joined here in the studio by Jim Sullivan, who is the executive director of the Bennington County Regional Commission, and uh, here to talk to us today about energy issues and uh, maybe their relationship with climate change and a few other uh, few other uh, aspects to that. Um, as we all know, energy issues have been kind of a, a major topic of discussion, not only here in Vermont, but uh, nationwide and, and globally as well. And this past year, it seems like uh, we're seeing another kind of uh, surge of interest around all of that. Uh, last September, many of you will remember a series of climate rallies took place, uh, one right here in Manchester and elsewhere around Vermont, also uh, in other major cities around the world. Uh, shortly after that, a, uh, a somewhat bleak uh, report on climate change was released by the United Nations and uh, more concern about rising temperatures and our apparent uh, difficulty with sort of curtailing the rise of, uh, of uh, temperatures that uh, could all of a sudden, not just uh, 30 or 40 years from now, but uh, 10 or 15 years from now, lead to some uh, rather bleak outcomes. Uh, here in Vermont, uh, the whole issue around carbon emissions seems to be uh, returning once again as an important topic for the legislature to grapple with when they return to Montpelier uh, in just a couple of weeks. So, uh, Jim, your arrival here is timely, and thank you, first of all, for making the time to come in and talk with us. Well, happy to be here. Thank you, Andrew. Really appreciate it. So, um, looking at uh, our position here in Vermont, just to kind of get us started, uh, what do you see as sort of the primary energy challenges that we're facing as a state? We have uh, those ambitious energy, renewable energy goals mm -hmm. we're trying to meet by 2050. Um, is that on track? Um, well, as you noted, uh, not really. Um, but there, there are, um, I don't know, probably uh, challenges and opportunities both on the energy front in Vermont. And the first, the first thing that um, is getting the attention now certainly is uh, issues related to climate change and, and uh, greenhouse gas emissions and our desire to try to reduce those significantly uh, over time to get to some um, established target levels. Uh, we've been doing better in that uh, in some areas and others in the area of uh, where we get our electricity from. We're actually doing quite well. Uh, we're not doing so well in areas of uh, um, uh, uh, space heating and transportation fuels. We can talk more about that in a little bit. But um, so, so you know, the, the desire to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is is important. Um, you know, there's been there can be some argument about um, how effective that's going to be because uh, you know climate change really is globally, and it's not like if we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions significantly in Vermont and they go up everywhere else in the world. Um, does not going to make much of a difference for us, but we hope that we can at least do our part as everyone needs to and set a good example and hopefully help drive some change nationally that way. Um, you know, the second thing is just on the energy front itself and, and an issue of that, that I always like to talk about is um, you know, energy security, whatever people might think about climate change, we still have the uh, inevitability that the fossil fuels that we've relied on over the last 150 years, increasingly so, that have really contributed to all of the, the growth and prosperity in our society, as well as a lot of, of problems, well, those are inevitably, over time, those are non-renewable resources, and they're going to become scarcer and more expensive and difficult to get. And whether it's 10, 20, or 50 years from now, our reliance on those is going to be have to, have to fall off. They're just going to get a lot more expensive and difficult to procure. So what in the world are we going to do when pretty much our entire society and economy relies on those things? So you know, trying to figure out a way to make to use less energy and to transition to different fuel types is really critical. And the third thing, and one I think everybody can really agree on, is uh, an opportunity, an economic opportunity. Because right now, um, you know, even Bennington County alone, we're exporting literally tens of millions of dollars every year out of the region's economy to purchase uh, these fuels that are imported into our region. 
And if we can reduce the amount that we spend on those, um, those fuel sources, we'll have that much more money to spend inside our own economy, in our own communities. And a lot of that money can actually be spent um, developing those new uh, renewable energy technologies and, and energy efficiency measures that help us meet our goals. So it's, a, you know, it's really a, a win-win and a great economic opportunity for us. Well, um, as you mentioned, uh, fossil fuels, gasoline, oil, propane have been so central and integral to how we get around uh, the operations of the economy. Replacing all that, or 90% of that, which I guess is our, what we'd like to try and do by, by 2050, that's a pretty tall order. And that's, isn't that going to be fairly expensive and fairly disruptive? Uh, well, it's a, it's a fairly tall order, um, but I think that it's something that's doable and it's something that, that we really have to do. Um, is it going to be expensive? Well, it's, it's going to be expensive, but continuing to rely on fossil fuels is, is pretty expensive, too. I, we, I think we've seen you know, the, the cost and, um, of renewable alternatives come down considerably. And, and you know, maybe if you look at it at a, at a more personal level, you can see how the, the opportunities are, are really there. While there's some cost, there's significant benefit. So if you look at just um, an individual's house, say, for example, um, will it cost money to to uh, weatherize the house? Um, yeah, it'll cost probably a few thousand dollars. Although there's some very good incentives for that right now. Um, will it cost to change over to an alternative heating system like a high efficiency air source heat pump or a wood burning um, furnace or, or boiler or a pellet stove? Yeah, that'll cost money too. But if you look at the other side of it, you'll you'll be saving more money than you're going to be spending in the long run, and quite a bit, actually. So, you know, play that out over the economy as a whole, and like, yeah, it costs a lot of money to invest in energy efficiency and renewable energy and alternative energy sources, but you save as much or more while doing some real positive things for the environment. So the hard part has always seemed to me to be to get over that hurdle, that initial hurdle, the, the upfront costs that folks will have mm -hmm. to um, somehow uh, deal with, uh, whether it's weatherizing a, mm -hmm. a home or, or another thing, which, which I know is kind of, a, I think, central to the long-term plan to kind of uh, reduce the amount of fossil fuels we, we burn in the transportation sector, and that's mm -hmm. increasing the... Um, the sales of, of electric cars. I mean, that seems to be seen as like one important ingredient in how we're eventually going to wind up spending less on, on fossil fuels. Uh, how is that going? Because, I, you know, I, electric cars seem to be a very attractive proposition. Uh, the maintenance costs, once, once you own one, the maintenance costs seem to be much less than, than a traditional uh, gas-powered car. Um, and yet, we're still seeing, I think, fairly small numbers of them on the roads. How do we get from, from here to there? Yes, that's something that uh, folks have been trying to, to figure <laughs> out, because you're absolutely right. That is a really uh, critical component of the, uh, the energy goals that the state has. And uh, the, the rate of uptake on electric cars has is, is been uh, Pretty, pretty low relative to where we'd like to see it. Um, and th that upfront cost, you're right, is, is, has been an impediment. And it is for a lot of newer technologies. Um, you know, I mean, if you look, remember the days when uh, the, the first energy efficient light bulbs came out and people were like, well, I'll pay $12 for a right. light bulb. Right. And, you know, now I the, do remember that. Yeah, and now <laughs> the energy efficient light bulbs are, you know, mm. less expensive than in a lot of times the incandescent bulbs and they cost a lot less to operate. So the, the, the challenge is, you know, to provide the, the, the programs and incentives that are needed to, to um, you know, get to increase the demand so that the supply is provided and as the supply comes up as more manufacturing happens then economies of scale start to kick in and, and it gets cheaper and we're certainly starting to see that in the electric vehicle or EV world um, it's perhaps not happening quite as hap as quickly as, as some would like and I think it's be partly because there's some misconceptions out there about electric cars too as far as the upfront cost I mean there's great incentives now uh, 
I bought, um, my wife and I bought an electric car, um, our second one, um, this past summer. And uh, it was, um, there was a $7,500 federal tax credit that comes right off the price of the car. There was a $5,000 incentive from the manufacturer uh, working with Green Mountain Power. And there was another $1,500 incentive from Green Mountain Power uh, through a state program. And then there was another just random uh, dealership uh, incentive for $1,000. So I, I think all in told, I believe we had at least 15000 Fifteen to sixteen thousand dollars off the price of the car. It took the car from being close to thirty thousand to about fifteen thousand dollars for a really nice brand new car. That's not too expensive if mm. if you're going to buy a new car. Yeah, you know that's not too bad. Now there's also a growing market for um, used EVs. You know, and there's also incentives for those. So mm. um, the, the the there's still you know. The, the battery price is still um, higher than we'd like it to be. And as I said, over time, the cost per kilowatt hour of battery capacity comes down and the, the vehicles will be even more affordable. The other big um, uh, concern that people always have with, with EVs is, um, is range, or this thing of range anxiety. I can't, right. I can't drive an electric car because I can't go anywhere and everywhere I want to go. And it's true right now that if I, in my, my car has a range of maybe 175 miles in the summer and, and a bit less in the winter. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be able to drive everywhere I want to all the time. But, you know, 90% of, well, 99% of the time, I can go everywhere I want to in a day. I mean, if people drove... 150 miles or more every day, they'd be putting 50,000 miles on their cars. And they're just, people by and large don't do that. You know, we use our cars to get around the town and the region. I drove my car up here today. I'll be driving it down to Stamford tonight. Not a problem. So, you know, by and large, you can get by. And so what my, my, my wife and I do, we have one electric car and we have one plug-in hybrid. So the you know, if, if one, so we're basically both driving electric cars, but the plug-in hybrid can switch over to gas. So if we are planning a longer trip, we'll take that one. Mm. So it works out very well. It's a good, it's a good solution. And, you know, I recognize the new car is, is not in the cards for everybody. It's, it, you know, it, 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 even with discounts, it can still be expensive. So, you know, we're, we're hoping that over time, um, you know, the price continues to come down. And as you mentioned, the operating cost is just a lot less. You know, it costs the equivalent of about $1.50 per gallon of gas to drive an electric car um, right now. And as you know, there's no oil changes. The mechanic, the, the mechanical systems are so much simpler. Very few things go go wrong. So it's a it's a great it's a great option, and I'm very enthusiastic about EVs. Well, one of the other areas uh, you folks at the BCRC have been uh, um, seeming to focus a lot of attention on lately uh, is is weatherization, you know, like, mm -hmm. which you also just mentioned there. Um, working with Efficiency Vermont to try and encourage more folks to uh, insulate their homes better or, or take some steps to, mm -hmm. uh, to reduce their energy consumption and uh, a win-win thing, heat their homes better, you know, particularly mm -hmm. with winter coming on. That's a, that's a big deal for a lot of us, me included, <laughs> who I just had, had, my, had an energy audit come to uh, over at my place. It's quite interesting to do the walkthrough. Um, I guess, uh, what's your sense on how that's going? Uh, we've been hearing about weatherization for a while now. Um, it seems like a logical, obvious step for the most folks, particularly uh, in a state like Vermont. We have a lot of older housing stock uh, built, you know, 50, 80, 100 years ago, in some cases much mm -hmm. longer than that. Uh, are the incentives in place for that, uh, do you think, sufficient to encourage enough people to make that step? Uh, there are some really good incentives now. I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, transportation and heating buildings, those are the two places that we really need to focus our energies. And so that's what we've been, we've been uh, really trying to push uh, at the Regional Commission and, w and in conjunction with our local energy committees. Um, yeah, we have an old, an older housing stock, um, a, a, a lot of drafty old buildings that, um, you know, you, you put a little bit of, of energy in and it 
goes, you know, right out and uh, out through the attic and uh, the the gaps in the walls, and it's really frustrating because you know that that little bit of energy in a properly weatherized house can can stay and, and heat the house and keep it warm for a long period of time and 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 keep it much more comfortable. I think that one of the real challenges with with the weatherization uh, move is it it can seem to be a little bit complicated because there's a lot of steps as you mentioned so you may have had a home energy walkthrough or a home energy audit so then you'll get a report back that that'll tell you you know here are 10 things you can do to to improve the energy performance of your house um, and then you'll need to say okay now I've got a you know I've got to get a contractor I've got to figure out how to pay for it so there's a financing piece that comes into it and then I you know to get any incentives I've got to get the inspections done and and people say ah you know this <laughs> too much work. Too, too much <laughs> yeah so there's there's really an effort out there to try to make it simpler and organizations like neighborworks of Western Vermont have been really involved in in trying to kind of um, walk, help people walk right through the process from beginning to end to, to go from getting the home energy audit done, um, you know, to, to seeing what the options are, and then pointing them very clearly to the incentives that are available. Like Efficiency Vermont now has an in incentive for the next year of, um, uh, I believe, 50% uh, of the cost of weatherization up to. Uh, $4,000 for most folks or $20,000 if you're um, higher income, but really significant incentive payments to, to bring the price down. And then there's uh, financing options that are available too that for a lot of people, you can finance the balance at, at a rate of anywhere from you know 0% to 4% interest and you find that the, the savings um, in, in the amount of fuel that you're burning uh, is significantly more than the cost of the improvement on a monthly basis. But I recognize that it's a bit intimidating, you know, and that's why I always encourage people, you know, talk to somebody who knows the process and can simplify it for you, you know. And, and in our area, um, NeighborWorks of Western Vermont is available, and for um, for uh, um, income eligible households, the Bennington Rutland Opportunity Council has a, the State Weatherization Assistance Program, and and they'll do work for free, so that that really helps reduce, <laughs> reduce the, yeah. the obstacle. <laughs> that sounds good. So, so yeah, it also seems that uh, a number of communities are starting or forming uh, local energy committees. I mean, mm -hmm. one in Dorset, uh, I guess, is probably the prime example. They uh, seem to have really gotten ahead of the curve and uh, are doing some uh, uh, interesting work uh, with the Vermont Council on rural development uh, right now. Um, but other towns seem to be kind of getting into that act as well. Uh, will those committees help sort of uh, regular, ordinary residents kind of get through that uh, the complexity of weatherization? Oh, absolutely. I, I think that the local energy committees are going to be absolutely critical to this, to, to the effectiveness of the, the uh, programs that are out there, uh, because that local contact and that local locally based information is really critical. Um, you know, a, a, I don't know what three or four years ago we developed a, a really comprehensive regional energy plan that had a lot of right. specific strategies about weatherization and transportation and, and renewable energy, and then we worked with most of the towns in our region at this point to develop local energy plans that kind of bring that down to the local level and say these are the kinds of things that need to be done in our community to make to, to help us reach our goals and to hit our targets um, and so it that's great we know what we need to do we know how many houses we need to weatherize we know you know how many um, uh, how much of the improvement to our transportation system needs to happen. We know all these things. We know numbers. But like, okay, now who's going to do it? And we really didn't have, other than, you know, uh, uh, you know, the Dorset Energy Committee that's been around for quite a while and a few um, loan advocates here and there, um, really didn't have that kind of organization. So um, almost a year ago, we put out a real push to try to get communities to form energy committees to work with their 
towns to take those town energy plans that have been developed and, and take some ownership of them and and kind of take the lead in implementing some of those those uh, programs and so that's so thankfully a lot of towns have really stepped up so we see new energy committees and you know Pownall and Bennington and Sunderland and Arlington and Manchester and so it's it's been really good to see and you know there a lot of them are just getting up and, and, and going now but I think there's a lot of enthusiasm and there's a lot of great people involved, and I think it's going to make a big difference. I, are there any wind projects happening anywhere in the state at this point? I don't think there are any large-scale ones happening right now in the state. Um, there are some smaller installations happening. Uh, you know, we have a we actually have a wind turbine manufacturer in Bennington County and Star Wind Turbines out in East Dorset. And mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is that they uh, are quite busy and have a, a lot of projects going out. They're the they're kind of the mid-scale, you know, um, you know, commercial-sized uh, turbines as opposed to the the really large installations you might like the ones you see up um, on the mountain uh, in Searsburg Seer 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 and yeah. and down on the Hoosac Range in in Massachusetts. Um, but you know, to to answer your question, yeah, kind of the the other leg of of our of our um, energy puzzle <laughs> or stool is. Um, renewable energy development because a lot of our um, a lot of our transition really relies on electrification so you know electric vehicles and um, uh, high efficiency electric heating systems and and uh, so we recognize that um, that we're actually going to have to we're probably going to use a lot more electricity over time notwithstanding our efforts to be more efficient we're still going to like over the through 2050 we'll probably be using 50 percent more electricity than we're using now and that's electricity has to come from somewhere um, the question is how much of it should we be generating locally in in our area and you make a lot of assumptions about that, but you know a significant amount would be a good thing in the distributed energy system because you control that and you have access to that um, rather than relying on you know hoped for renewable energy imports from places like Hydro Quebec or offshore wind projects mm. or something like that. So in our regional energy plan, we do call for like 85 megawatts of new solar energy capacity and. Um, you know, wind really is a significant uh, component. It should be probably another 25 or 25 megawatts of wind um, energy capacity in our region over the next 30 plus years. Um, how do how do we get there? Well, there's been quite a bit of solar energy development happening. Uh, you know, rooftop and backyard solar of different scale has been significant, and there have been some larger installations, um, controversial and not. Um, the wind, um, you know, there has not been a lot of progress on wind energy development recently since the Deerfield Wind Project, um, right. the second phase of that in Searsburg. Um, I think, you know, over time, that you know, the, the importance of wind to balance out the energy um, uh, load over time is really going to become compelling. You know, solar is, is great. Um, uh, you know, I have solar panels on my house for both electricity and hot water, but I will tell you on days like this, um, there's not a lot going on. <laughs> and, you know, so-called, you know, storage will only do so much. It's not like, you know, in, in, the, in the summer, we're not going to store all the electricity that we need to use in the winter. And on days like this in the winter, you're not going to store enough electricity to even use overnight. So, you know, balancing it out with um, another energy, so renewable energy source like, like wind is really important uh, and, and a good thing. And I, I appreciate the fact that not everybody likes to look at solar panels or wind turbines, and they shouldn't be everywhere, and we should avoid them in, in environmentally sensitive and aesthetically sensitive areas. But um, if we want to get to where we say we want to get to, we're going to have to accept that we need some of them. Well, as someone who deals in land use planning an awful lot, I guess I'm wondering, do you, are you seeing any headway or progress finally being made around the idea of uh, setting aside certain parcels of land within given, given communities that most folks would say, okay, over here, where there used to be a landfill, let's say, is a good place to have a solar development. It can be screened off so the neighbors don't get, have mm -hmm. to look at it and you, we can get away from the not in my backyard mm -hmm. mentality. Um, are we finally beginning to make some progress in that direction where we're going to be able to come up with some sensible rules around 
land, you know, where to site them so that people who live next to them don't kind of yeah. oh, have I, a hard time? I, I, think, I think we are, and I think that we have, and, and I think we should have been thinking that way many years ago. <laughs> but, but um, you know, the, the state has identified kind of these statutorily defined preferred sites. They call them preferred sites. Things like old landfills, abandoned gravel pits, Develop surfaces like rooftops and and parking lots and, and brownfield sites, and those are those get a um, uh, an automatic um, incentive for anyone who who builds on them. So developers certainly go right there. They look for those places first and foremost, and that's good. Now, on top of that, in all the towns that we've been working with, we've been strongly encouraged encouraging them to do some real hard thinking and planning, um, bring out all the maps, involve property owners and neighbors and everybody else, and try to identify enough land in their community to support a reasonable amount of solar development. And once that land is developed, is identified to, you know, put it right on the map in the, in the town plan and said, this is our town preferred site for solar. We've talked about the, the different places. We've determined that, that, the, that the negative impacts associated with developing on this site are, are something that we can accept, uh, given the benefit to our community, and so put on a map. And several towns in, in our region have done that already. And so those operate just like you know, um, building on those statutory sites. Mm -hmm. So the developers get the same incentive for locating on those town identified sites. So we're 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 pro probably in our region in Bennington County we're pushing that idea more than anywhere else in the state. But I think it has real um, uh, real good prospects for success. We have time for about one more uh, this, uh, question here, and I, I guess I I can't let you leave without giving you a chance to talk a little bit about your uh, wood heating and biomass event you're having oh, at the sure. uh, Union Underground Restaurant in Manchester. Uh, I think uh, on on Wednesday the the tenth. 11th? Um, actually, it's it's this it's week? the tenth. The tenth. Tuesday, the tenth. Tomorrow. So Right away, yeah. Right. So, well, thanks for that. Yeah, no. Because I, I think that that's been another important part of the whole uh, puzzle as well. It, it, it is. I mean, if if you look out almost uh, any window, uh, you will see a, a lot of energy resource uh, all over the the hills and mountainsides here, and that's, you know, those those woody biomass resources contain a lot of energy, and properly managed can produce, uh, you know, sustainable harvest, and again support the local economy while providing um, uh, plenty of heat for, for hundreds or thousands of additional uh, buildings in our region. Um, so there's also some good incentives out there now for purchasing um, new wood-based heating systems uh, for residential and commercial scale. But the one, the meeting we're doing at Union Underground um, tomorrow at uh, 530 is, uh, is focused on the residential sector specifically and looking at the opportunities for um, for cordwood and wood pellet based uh, systems in the home specifically. So we'll have somebody from the uh, the wood heating specialist from the Vermont uh, Department of Forest Parks and Recreation will be down to talk about their programs and the reason we're having it at Union Underground other than the fact that it's a really great place to have a meeting and they have a, a pretty good tap list I think is that um, they, that entire building is actually heated with a, uh, a pellet system. Oh, really? So they be, have an opportunity to take a look at that as well. And probably have a bit of a dinner afterwards. There's <laughs> free refreshments, and as I said, it's a, it's, a, it's a great place for a meeting. All right. Well, uh, there's so much more we could talk about uh, on this uh, fascinating subject. Uh, and, the, and one of them, is, uh, I always find myself wondering about is like, what happens if none of this gets done? You know, I mean, uh, if, 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 if none of these initiatives ever gain traction to the point where they need to, um, wow, I guess... Um, well, that's, that could be like a, a, an entire really yeah. depressing show. Right. We could talk about that for <laughs> half an hour and probably get really, uh, really bummed out, I'm sure. Yeah. But anyway, we'll save that for another time. Maybe okay. sometime next, next time you're back. Great. We'll talk about that one. <laughs> All right. Well, Jim, thanks so much for being with us today. Really Thank appreciate you, your, your time and, and, uh, and input on this really important subject. And... Uh, Thank, thanks to you as well for being with us today as, uh, also. Hope you've enjoyed the show and found it informative, and we'll see you again the next time. Have a great day.